Hi again, everybody. My name is Rob Rosenthal with AskTheLawyers.com, and this is another edition of Ask the Lawyers. Today's topic is emergency room malpractice. What is it? How do you know if you're a victim? Well, here to have our uh, questions answered is attorney Nancy Winkler of the Pennsylvania-based Eisenberg, Rothweiler, Winkler, Eisenberg, and Jack PC. And the law firm focuses its practice on catastrophic personal injury and has recovered hundreds of millions of dollars for victims of personal injury cases uh, nationwide. Nancy, thank you for taking some time to be with us today. I appreciate it. Thank you. So how common is medical malpractice in an emergency room? Unfortunately, it's very common. Uh, people go into the emergency room, obviously, with uh, you know emergent situations, uh, life-threatening many times. And, you know, emergency room physicians uh, look for uh, what the presenting problem is, but sometimes uh, what happens is they're not looking at the, the whole picture. And there may be other things that they find incidentally, for example, in a chest X-ray, and they never tell the uh, patient about it. Hmm. And that can also be a life-threatening situation. There are okay. medical errors that are made all the time with medications as well. So I assume there are different levels of malpractice then? Well, when you say levels, there are different types of malpractice okay. that occur in the emergency room. Um, you know, it could be a situation where a patient comes in with chest pain and they're not triaged promptly enough and they may have a heart attack while they're waiting to be seen. Uh, those are horrible, unfortunate situations that we have seen. Um, a lot of times the uh, emergency malpractice occurs because the emergency rooms are understaffed. Mm -hmm. There are emergency room physicians that are, you know, oftentimes, you know, trying their best. But when uh, there's inadequate staffing, uh, sometimes things slip through the cracks. Uh, an x-ray might not be reviewed. A medication might not be uh, dosed properly. Uh, somebody might not be seen as promptly as they should be. Is it also a problem that just by the very nature of an emergency room, there can be a lot of things happening at once and they're, and they're moving very quickly and maybe they don't have the time to focus on each individual patient? Well, it's, it, that, that is a problem, but that, you know, when you go to an emergency room and when you are seen by a physician, no matter where you're seen, you should be getting adequate medical care and appropriate medical care. And so if there's not enough staffing in the emergency room because it's a busy center, that's a problem. Um, people come in and they are seen rather quickly and that's why monitoring of the patient is so crucial in the emergency room setting so that uh, their vitals can be monitored appropriately. You know, the, the doctors are trying to, to triage and to figure out what the problem is, uh, but it's very, very important to be monitoring all of the uh, signs and symptoms that are presenting to the, uh, to the medical providers in the emergency room. Is it just on the doctors or is the nurses and others involved too, or does, is the ultimate uh, responsibility lie with the doctor? How does that work? Well, good point. No, it's not just with the doctors. I mean, there is an attending physician generally that is seeing a patient, but it could be in the nursing setting as well. Uh, nurses are providing monitoring of the patients. There are different types of medical negligence cases that occur in the emergency room setting. I can tell you about a couple of examples. Uh, you know, I, you know, unfortunately, over the, the past 30 some years, we've seen a lot of uh, incidents involving emergency room malpractice and things that should just never have happened. Um, we had a lady that, um, you know, was seen in the emergency room and she had horrible abdominal pain. Uh, they did what's called an obstruction series of uh, x-rays to determine if she had a, a possible obstruction. They discharged her and basically said it was an infectious process, um, you know, and, and just to see her family doctor, you know, within the next week. And what happened is in the actual x-ray series, the radiologist said they could not rule out an obstruction and she should have a, a, a CT or a CAT scan. This unfortunately never got done. It ne the information never got relayed to the patient and the CT was never done, probably because she did not have health insurance and she was on public assistance. We see that happen in some of the, uh, the, the settings, the city settings in our hospitals, unfortunately. So when you see, we see that happening, people, a lot of people go to the emergency room because they may not have a primary care physician. 
uh, and it may not have insurance. So you're saying sometimes the level of care for people without insurance is different than for those with? Uh, you know, I'd like to say that's not the case, but uh, it's unfortunately, it is the case many, many times. Hmm. Um, and I'll tell you another uh, example of just some of the types of things that we've seen over the course of years. I had a lady that went into the emergency room because she had hypertension, high blood pressure, and she had a fainting episode very serious and they were monitoring her and they did monitor her and part of what they did is they did a chest x-ray to see if there was anything else going on possibly a, a pulmonary embolus um what happened is she was later discharged after uh her her blood pressure came down and was normalized and she was told to go see her family physician a week later unbeknownst to her there was a nodule in her lung it was an incidental finding but there was a nodule in there in her lung that the radiologist reported that it could not it could it could be uh, a cancerous nodule, possibly you don't know. And further correlation needed to be done. Further clinical studies needed to be done. And uh, and what happened with this unfortunate woman is over two years after that she started to exhibit some signs of lung cancer. She was a non-smoker. When they went back. She went to the emergency room over two years after that first event. When she went back into the emergency room, they looked back at that study and saw that, in fact, that nodule had been there all along. Oh, wow. So um, th this, it is very, very important that when a person is seen in the emergency room, that the physicians and the nurses and the, the medical providers caring for them don't see the patient just as you know one specific problem that they present with, but really see the whole patient and see everything that they present with, uh, and and that's why they're there. What is a what is a, a rule of thumb, or or how does someone if they they've they've come out of the hospital or they've been through the emergency room, how do you know whether okay I just something happened or it's medical malpractice or maybe you're the loved one of someone who has passed away at what point is it just a little voice in your head that goes you know maybe something doesn't seem right and that's when you contact an attorney how do you know when to get an attorney involved yeah i mean if, if you have any question first of all i mean you you can ask any you know if you have a family doctor somebody that you trust um that's always a good resource but you know sometimes the doctor might not give you the straight scoop either. And if you have a question, it never hurts to see a lawyer and have somebody investigate what I consider our firm to be as a resource for individuals. It doesn't cost them anything to have a consultation or for us to look at medical records and to get answers for families. A lot of times I, you know, I just had a case today that I'm telling a family, you know, I did not find that there was any medical negligence. Unfortunately, it was a bad outcome, but there was no medical negligence. It gives closure to a family to know that somebody's looked at the medical records with another eye. We employ experts to look at the medical records after we do uh, so that they can determine if there is any medical negligence. What are some things that, that have to be proven? You, let's say you go to court uh, for a medical malpractice case. What are some of the things you have to prove in court to, to prove that it is medical malpractice? Well, you have to prove that there has been what's called a deviation from the standard of care, which means there's negligence. Um, when we say a deviation from the standard of care, uh, it, it doesn't, you know, somebody could uh, act somewhat negligently, uh, you know, the colloquial term negligent, um, but it might not rise to what is considered to be a deviation from the standard of care for an emergency room doctor or nurses in the emergency room setting. And you have to be able to show that that deviation from the standard of care has caused the harm to the individual. In Pennsylvania and New Jersey, where uh, the majority of our cases are uh, for medical negligence, we need to file either what's called a certificate of merit or an affidavit of uh, merit uh, from a medical provider showing that a medical provider has reviewed the case and that there is a reasonable probability based upon the medical records that there was a deviation from standard of care that caused the harm. Um, and, it, you know, we're very, very careful about uh, those cases. Uh, medical experts uh, review every case before a case of ours goes into suit. Right. Nancy, thank you so much for your time today. I do appreciate it. I think it's some helpful information. Thank you.
That's going to do it for this episode of Ask the Lawyers. My guest has been Nancy Winkler of the Pennsylvania-based firm of Eisenberg, Rothweiler, Winkler, Eisenberg, and Jeck. And uh, we would hope you take a second at the click on the button at the bottom of the screen so you can subscribe to our YouTube channel and you'll know when we have future episodes of Ask the Lawyer. If you think you might be the victim of medical malpractice and you want the best information or you're ready to choose a lawyer that lawyers choose, please visit AskTheLawyers.com. I'm Rob Rosenthal for AskTheLawyers.com.